Russ Granger, the author of The Seven Triggers to Yes, is an expert in the art of persuasion. His book has won the Small Business Award and is available in a variety of languages. When I saw the program and we talked about it, I invited one of my partners, uh, Eric Weiss, to attend and he said to me, Russ Granger, wait a minute. He used to be my neighbor. <laughs> but I have no idea what he does. Well, tonight, Eric, you're going to get to hear exactly what he is. Russ is a trainer, management consultant, speaker, and author with more than 30 years' experience in executive management for public and private companies. He spent decades using his degree in psychology to research and teach the art of science and the, uh, uh, the science of persuasion and motivation. Success in business and in life requires getting yes decisions and actions from others. Should we use logic and reason as the best way to persuade people? Well, Russ might tell us it's the wrong approach. So sit back, let's listen to what he has to say. I think it's going to be well worth it. Russ? Thank you very much. Thank you. Like Sam, uh, I wonder who they're talking about sometimes. Uh, well, how many of you are uh, directly involved in uh, closely held corporations? Let me see a show of hands. Yeah, just, just about everybody. Um, OK, um, as far as the goals that you have for your companies, for your business, for your own operations, you can have anything you want, anything. All you have to do is to get somebody or find somebody to give you what you want or to do what you want. Business and success is literally that simple. And we're going to share some ideas about how to make it not only simple, but uh, very, very direct as far as um, getting the results that you want. OK. Um, how much value would it be to be a persuader? Persuaders rule. Persuaders have always ruled, and they will always rule. They get the results that they want. OK? How much value would it be to you, as a closely held business person, woman, man, whatever, to be able to get the results you want from the other people that you interact with, whether it be your employees, whether it be your clients, your customers, even your banker, would that be helpful to you to be able to get them to do what you want them to do? Let me see a show of hands again. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it would. I think it would, because if we can get people to do what we want, we can achieve the goals that we have. I got, uh, is there a, uh, I know there are several teachers, but is there a teacher here? Uh, I got an email um, from uh, one of the uh, company people, actually uh, from, from Alice, asking whether this participation in this would be worthwhile for a teacher. I will share with you that we get feedback from literally all kinds of individuals in all kinds of situations because when you want to get things done, you are always interacting with other people and you are always trying to get people to either give you what you want or to do what you want and to do it in a very willing fashion. So that's really where we need to go um, on this. Uh, to do that, uh, we have some very exciting new information, information that has not been around before, information that is relatively new. How new is it? Uh, have you all seen the, um, the article reprint? I, I think it was sent out that was in Selling Power magazine. Let me see how many of you have seen that. Just a few. OK. All right. Well, that article is as recent as about uh, a month ago. Uh, and we, we had some people who were interviewed for that, and we're going to share some input on them. But this is brand new information that has only been found out in the last few years as to what works with the human mind and what does not work with the human mind, and more importantly, why it works, and even more importantly than that, putting together a process. You're going to hear things tonight that you have done before and say, well, I did that, or I did this, and I did that. But we're going to put this together in a format that will enable you to get a process to do what you want. I'd like you to just take a couple minutes, a few seconds even, and think about something that we call a current persuasion opportunity. 
I'd like you to think about something that you would like to persuade someone in your organization, whether it be an employee, whether it be an owner, whether it be someone uh, who is a client or customer, or even your banker or anyone else. Just think about some situation that you would like to get somebody else to agree to, to say yes to. All right, just think about that for a minute. Some idea that we refer to as your CPO, your current persuasion opportunity. And think about that in, in a real world context, something that you are going to be doing over the next day or two, over the next week, or certainly within the near future. Something that you need to persuade someone else to do to make your business better, more profitable, growing, whatever it is that you want to accomplish. That CPO will be very critical because we don't want to provide theoretical information tonight. We don't want to provide ideas that you walk away with and say, well, gee, that was really interesting. What I'm going to try to share with you are concepts and thoughts that you can put into very specific applications. Would that be worthwhile for you? If I could give you one or two ideas that you could take home and really put to use, would that be worthwhile? Let me see a show of hands. All right, okay, that's, uh, that's exactly what we're, what we're going to try to, to do with you, uh, for you today. Okay, my background is primarily uh, as a sole proprietor, a businessman. I've spent uh, a lot of time in corporate life, but, um, I really started out in selling, and literally when I was about eight years old, I sold magazine subscriptions. Uh, in fact, my mom just came across, uh, she lives in Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, she just came across two ticket stubs to Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus that I won selling subscriptions when I was nine years old. Uh, so my selling career and my business career goes back that far. And I've sold, you know, literally everything from then. Uh, magazines, uh, I've sold encyclopedias, I've sold life insurance, property and casualty insurance, uh, real estate, uh, I've sold consulting, and uh, I've sold training products. And for how many of you have been around the Wayne area f since like the 70s? Anyone? Yeah, many of you. Uh, we also had a partner and I, uh, while, while we were all doing other things, set up an uh, entrepreneurial little thing on Route 23. We set up the Quick Tunes Tune Up Center which we were going to franchise all over the world, except for one thing. We didn't realize that the cars were coming out with electronic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, things that uh, did not need tune-ups anymore. So that's one of the entrepreneurial fun things that you go through. Okay, um, as, uh, as Ira said, I did get a, a, de a degree in psychology, and we really learned a great deal about the process of what it takes to motivate other people, what it takes to get yes decisions from other people, and what it takes to sell. We were brought in, uh, when I lived in Parsippany uh, not too many years ago, uh, my company was brought in, uh, the head of AT&T by then, at that time was Bob Allen, and Bob Allen had parceled out a great deal of money to uh, the Tuck School at Dartmouth, to the Kellogg School at uh, Northwestern University, to the Wharton School at U of P, and so on to try to come up with all of the information that would be applicable to persuasion and to the sales process. And we were brought in to analyze that information, to put together all of the information that they had, uh, uh, had assembled and to create training programs from that. So we actually created uh, the sales training programs for AT&T and for 22 of their divisions. Uh, that's really where I got involved in the the concepts of really looking into what works and what doesn't work in salespeople. We found that, um, that these skills work in virtually any level. Now a lot of people are looking for jobs. Anybody here know of anybody that is looking for a job? Okay, sure, we all know of some. Uh, one of the, you know one of the few places that is really hiring right now? Most of the people are letting people go. Uh, I happen to live now on the eastern shore of Maryland, okay, we're about 40 miles away from the center of the hiring world right now, which is what? Washington. Washington. And a little comment about the, uh, the hiring process. They had, uh, they needed some new people, so they set up a very simple hiring process. And uh, the first person that came in for an interview was a recent graduate from William Patterson University with a math degree. And they sat, sat him down and said, uh, we have a very simple process for analyzing the people we want. 
how much is two and two? And the guy looked at me and says, I just graduated with a math degree. He says, of course, it's four. And he said, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. Uh, the next gentleman that came in uh, was a, an accountant. Ira, I think you have an accounting firm, I uh, said, part of it. And uh, so they said to the accountant, uh, we're going to give you the same question we ask everybody else. How much is two and two? And he thought for a minute and he said, well, he says, what kind of accounting are we doing? He says, are we doing cash accounting? Are we doing government accounting? Are we doing tax accounting? Are we doing accounting for the board of directors? He says, by and large, he said, it's going to be around, around four, give or take maybe 15 or 20 percent. Okay? <laughs> the third, third guy comes in, and he is an economist. Actually had worked for the government before. So they pose the same question to him, how much is two and two? The economist gets up, walks to the door, closes the door, locks the door, goes back, sits down, looks him right in the eye, what do you want it to be? <laughs> So that's how the hiring process goes in Washington. If you use the right skills, uh, I think, think we can get there and get that done. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the, the process of what we're going to be sharing with you today. Does anyone remember the man who was designated as the top executive of the 20th century? He was on the cover of virtually every magazine, Business Week, Time, all of them. Yes, who said it? Please. It was on the screen. Doggone, I gave it away. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah, yeah, Jack Welch. What did Jack Welch do? Does anyone remember? Yeah, he was CEO of GE, but why was he, why was he uh, nominated, elected, and, and given the designation as the top CEO of the entire 20th, 20th century, beating out uh, Henry Ford, beating out Bill Gates, beating out uh, Trump and all the others. Anyone remember what he did? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. He did a couple other things as well, but that's, that's one of the, the characteristics that he said. Why did Jack Welch have such incredible success doing what he did? Jack Welch, um, in, in his book, uh, which is entitled Jack Straight from the Gut, stated very simply, nearly everything I've done has been accomplished with other people, Jack Welch. Now, before we leave tonight, I'm going to share, because you're going to wonder whether th what we're talking about tonight really works, I'm going to share how Jack Welch did the most fascinating, largest, and in most incredible corporate turnaround ever in the history of American industry with just one trigger and one sentence. Absolutely extraordinary. Okay? And I've asked Sam in case I forgot and we get wrapped up at the end uh, that I, I must tell that story because it is really truly fascinating about how these things work. Okay. What do we want to get yes to? with prospects and clients. We want to get appointments. We want to convince people to meet with us. Incidentally, uh, how many of you consider yourself salespeople, even though you're in business? Outstanding, outstanding, because a lot of this is going to be focused on small business, uh, but it is really focused on sales because we're always selling what? What are we selling? Anyone? Sales. We're selling ourselves, number one. Number two, what else do we sell? Service. Service. What else? Products, yeah, yeah, that's what we really get right down with. We've got a lot of do other things. So let's talk about some of the people that, or some of the things we have to get done. We have to get appointments. We have to get commitment for a presentation. We have to get the right location. We have to get the right people together. We have to get involvement. We have to get people's attention. With our prospects and clients, we've got to get activity. We've got to get a discussion. We have to overcome resistance and objections. Okay, we have to get the client actively participating. We've got to overcome those. We've got to get the final agreement and close the sale. And hey, we certainly better get referrals too. All right, we've got to build positive relationships. Even within our own organizations, we have a lot of persuading to do. Uh, we have to obtain the leads that we need. We have to get our budgets approved, either by our banker or by our own organization or by the people whom we might, might report to. If we work for a company, we might want to get a raise. We might want to get approvals for allocations, provide discounts. With company personnel, we also want to get delivery issues, get the boss involved in our sales, 
better marketing support. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on, okay? Uh, we've got to build internal relationships, and that's uh, another very important thing that a lot of times business people neglect to do as well as they do try to do it with their uh, clients and customers. We want to get the results, and that's an important one too. We want to get results from those whom we have no authority. There's a lot of people that do not report directly to us that we have to get to do things, and that's what persuasion is really all about. Okay, we have to get others to act on our ideas, our proposals, our solutions, and our projects. All right, let's go back to the fourth century BC. Aristotle and Plato wrote three volumes on the skill of persuasion. It is the oldest research skill in the world. Does anyone have any idea why persuasion is the oldest research skill in the entire world? Anyone? Hello? <laughs> oh, wow. Be yes. Adam and Eve. There you go. <laughs> that takes it back even a little further, doesn't it? <laughs> Love it. Excellent answer. The reason that, that this is the oldest research skill in the world is because it is the most important skill in the world. Why did Aristotle and Plato find it necessary to do research and write three volumes on persuasion? What did those crazy Greeks do back in the 4th and 5th century BC? They created what? A new form of government. Yeah, and no longer could you rule by the club and the sword. You ruled with what? Persuasion. You had to get people to do what? Vote for you. And once you got voted into office, you had to get people to do what? Do whatever you wanted to do. And they came up with a crazy new form of jurisprudence called what? The jury. And guess what? How did you win the jury trials? With persuasion. So Aristotle and Plato wrote these three volumes. And in volume one of the three volumes, okay, Aristotle said that reason and logic should be the best routes to persuasion. In fact, Aristotle added that it is a human failing that we are sometimes more persuaded by emotion than by logic and reason. Okay, now fast forward to the turn of the century, about uh, seven or eight or nine years ago, when for the first time in history, we could actually look at, see, and follow the brain in real time. Very, very interesting. For the first time, for 2,500 years, we guessed, we guessed at how the brain responded to our uh, requests. Okay? And we said very simply to all business people that emotions get in the way of good logic and reason and good decisions. All right? So fast forward and let's see what we can learn from, from there. Major funding for The Secret Life of the Brain is provided by the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future. Okay, tonight is your investment in your future. Okay, this information, a lot of the slides that you see and a lot of the information comes from uh, the five-part PBS series which is called The Secret Life of the Brain and the book of the same title written by Dr. Richard Restack who is a uh, neurophysicist, neuroscientist uh, in Washington, D.C. The adult brain is capable of the whole panoply of human thought. But it's emotion that is at the very heart of our thinking lives. Our lives are governed by emotions and the interaction of emotions with our thought processes. That's, that's who we are. We are emotional people. There is no such thing as a, a non-emotional moment in life.
we think by feeling. What is there to know? I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. Um, the whole concept here is that we are feeling people, okay? We are not thinking people, we are feeling people. And we're going to come up, uh, are there any of the technical people here or can we access any of them to find out what happened to the sound? Okay, all right, thanks, thanks. Um, okay, the whole idea is that we are not thinking machines. We are feeling machines that think. Okay, and this is what came out of the discoveries that Dr. Ristak made, and uh, we'll just go through these. Uh, Richard Ristak is a, uh, he is a doctor, he's a neurologist, neuropsycho ne neuropsychologist, researcher, and clinical professor. Uh, the, the, uh, the music came across, but uh, nothing else did. The, the music was there, so we had sound, but the, uh, the, the speech did not come across. Uh, I'll, I'll get to the next one in just a moment. Uh, he is one of the uh, top neurological scientists. Uh, he is a recipient of the Medal for Humanity in Medicine and the Decade of the Brain Award. It is not possible to have a properly working reason system without having a properly working emotion system. What you think, what you create, the problems you solve, the way you reason, don't exist in a vacuum. There is always the backdrop of emotion and feeling. We are not thinking machines. We are feeling machines that think. The narrator there is uh, Dr. Uh, De Tomasio, and he is at the University of Southern California, and his science and all of his writings, he has had uh, three books on the New York Times uh, top 10 bestseller list, is decision making. He is involved totally with how the brain makes decisions. Now here's an important question. Why should we care? Why is it important to us to understand how our brains and how the other person's brain makes a decision? Why would that be important to us? We can speak to it, yeah. Only when we know and understand how that other person's brain processes the information that we provide can we understand how to provide the right information. It's that simple. So we're not going to try to make you neuroscientists tonight. We're not going to try to make you um, anything uh, other than knowledgeable about how the brain makes its decisions because that is one of the things that we want you to leave with tonight is the understanding of how we have to approach the other person's brain. And it's not the way we thought. We had it all backwards for 2,500 years. We literally had it backwards because we believed what Aristotle and Plato said and wrote and that was followed up on by the psychologists, by the psychoanalysts, by the business people for t literally for 2,500 years. So what I'm going to share, I'm going to ask you to keep an open mind because this is different. It's new and it defies what we've been taught. It defies what we've been taught. So keep an open mind and understand that this is the way that the brain really works and it's important to understand the way the brain works for the simple reason that without that, we can't influence. Again, here's a reprise, we are not thinking machines, we are feeling machines that happen to be able to think. Okay, now, in one of Dr. Ristak's uh, additional books called Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot, he lists some of the things that we have believed over time but that he found are dead wrong. The brain does not operate a, like a computer. There is no analogy between how our brains function and computers. We often try to compare uh, the brain to the computer, but there is no analogy at all. The brain does not operate like any machine. Now here's the critical statement that I hope you'll take away with you tonight as one of the learning points at least that we're, we're trying to share. 
that we have to stop forcing the brain to act in ways that are unnatural. Because what we have learned by looking at the brain, by watching, because of the only ability that we've ever had has been since there have been machines like fMRI scans, not MRI scans, but FM, functional magnetic resonance imaging scans, which actually can watch in live, in real time, what the brain is doing, and to see the oxygen, neuron, and blood flows, and we can tell which parts of the brain are being activated by the sensory input that we provide, including what? Our requests for action and decisions. Okay? So that's the important part uh, here. All right? The brain is not a logic machine. That we've already gone over. Emotions and feelings about someone or something occur before you've made any attempt at conscious evaluation. Interesting. Very interesting. Now here's another comment uh, from uh, Professor Joseph Riemann, and this really gets down to the heart of, of what we're talking about. Riemann says that neuroimaging technology allows us to measure brain activity, and it does so, so more accurately because the neurons don't lie. They don't give us conceptual ideas. We can see where they go. These little guys, neurons, all 10 billion of them, prove there is a chemical and biological basis for how we behave. And hey, their message is business behaves wrongly. And this was printed in the uh, Harvard Business Review uh, put out by, uh, by doc Dr. Riemann. Okay, the summary. With real-time brain imaging, we have learned that, the that there is a chemical and biological basis for how we decide and act. And if we recognize that and we understand how it works, we're in a much better position to get yes. We're not thinking machines that do a little reprise here. We are not influenced primarily by logic and uh, cognitive reasoning. We just, the brain just doesn't function that way, and they're just now finding that out. We are influenced to act by our own databases. Now, this is an important consideration. We are not applying triggers, and we're going to get to what triggers are in just a couple minutes. We are not applying triggers to other people. We are working with their own internal navigation system, okay? This is the system that helps us get through every day. Think about it. When you get up in the morning, how many decisions do you have to make before you even get out of the house or get to work? All right? You got to decide which clothes you're going to wear. You got to decide which shoes, which tie, which shirt. Do I wear a jacket? Do I not? Uh, what am I going to have for breakfast? Am I going to stick to the diet or am I really going to go whole hog? Which route am I going to take to work? Am I going to get gas on the way to work or on the way home? Should I listen to the news or put on a CD? Which CD? What would happen if we had to logically analyze and critically evaluate in the uh, thinking part of the brain each of those decisions? Nothing would happen. That's exactly right. We'd be locked in place. We'd be absolutely unable to do things. So we have built up within us a self-navigation system that is triggered primarily by the little guy who we are going to talk much more about tonight, which is the amygdala. And we're going to get to that in just a minute because that's, that's a very uh, critical concept. All right, so we are influenced to act by our own databases, our own internal guidance system. So we are not putting ideas in other people's head. We are not forcing people to do things that they should not do or don't want to do. We are actually helping activate them to get to the right decision. And here's the key word, a shared conclusion. And this, too, is right out of the Harvard uh, Business School and the HBR uh, printed magazine. The whole process is a shared conclusion. We'll get to that. And here's another comment. Persuasion is grounded in basic scientific, practical, and learnable principles. That's why I ask you to keep an open mind, because we can learn these principles of persuasion and the ways that we can get other people to do what we want them to do that is right for them. The course is dedicated to the process of getting people to say yes, and it's helping to get yes for you. And if there was ever a time for the business, man, business people to learn the fine art of persuasion, it is now. And this also is from HBR. Okay, how do we get other people to do what we want? 
We can force them to do it. We're bosses. We own businesses. We're managers. What's wrong with force as a way to get people to do things? Pardon? It's negative. It's negative. Yeah. Pardon? It's, it's bullying. It's bullying. Well, so what's so bad about that? If you get it, if you get what you want done, it, it's okay. Yes, in the back. It can build resentment. Yes. It's demotivating. You might get what you want done, but are you going to get it done with complete, enthusiastic, positive action? No, it's going to be demotivating. So force is not a good way to do it. When I grew up in corporate life, that's pretty much what we do. The bosses told us what to do. Uh, I'm talking about, obviously, many years ago when I worked with a, a major uh, financial services and insurance corporation. All right, the second way we can get people to do things is to negotiate with them, right? What's wrong with negotiation? Why isn't that a good way to get things done? Anyone? They might prevail. Say again? They might prevail. Yeah, they might prevail. What is uh, Herb Cohen's definition? Uh, any of you read Herb Cohen's books? He's written many on the skill of negotiation. They give up something to get something. Well, that's right. He says, negotiate. Don't. He says, first of all, don't negotiate if there's any other way to do it. And the second thing that he said is negotiation is a process where two people get what neither of them want. Okay? All right? That's, the, that's Herb Cohen's definition of negotiation. So what does that leave? That leaves persuasion. If force doesn't work, if negotiation doesn't work, persuasion can. And we can get people to do things with full compliance and full motivation ability to, to get what it is that we want. Persuasion this is an important concept. Persuasion is a process. It, it is not an event. It is a learned process. It is a time-consuming process. It takes research and it takes hard work on your part to be a successful, great persuader. It is not an event. There is no silver bullet that I can share with you that makes it work. We just have to learn what the process is. And of course, selling is persuasion. What is persuasion? Okay. A lot of people say to me, Russ, what is persuasion? Well, we have a few definitions. One is that persuasion is the art of getting someone to do something that he or she might not do if you didn't ask. Does that make a good definition of persuasion? Yeah, I think so. Okay, when one influences another thoughts, attitudes, feelings, behaviors, and actions, persuasion has occurred. Isn't this what we want people to do when we're talking to them, whether it be a client, whether it be an employee, whether it be your banker, whether it be a customer or whatever. We want them to change their attitudes, their feelings, their behaviors, and their actions. If we can do that, we have done the persuasion job. Persuasion is the language of business leadership. Okay, and here's the key, the one that we want you to take home tonight. Persuasion is leading others to a shared solution and desired action. To that end, we are going to refer tonight to the person that you are persuading, the person that you have in mind for your CPO, your current persuasion opportunity. We're going to refer to that person as your partner. Why do you think we refer to that person as your partner in persuasion? Anyone? Benefits both of you. Yeah. Yeah, you're striving for to be an equal directed conclusion that's good for both of you. We are not manipulating people. That is the opposite of persuasion, manipulation. We are using internal data banks that exist in the other person to help them make decisions and to get us to a shared conclusion. Okay, now here's the normal way that we generally go about persuading someone else. We state our position clearly and with conviction. We, play, we present our supporting data, our arguments and our facts, and we structure the deals and move on to conclusion. Does that sound about the way we normally do it? Anyone, uh, anyone agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's wrong with that? Okay, is there anything wrong with that? All right, Dr. Jay Conger, director of the Leadership Institute at the University of USC, uh, says the reality is that following this process is a surefire way to fail at persuasion. Okay, Conger adds, many business people misunderstand persuasion and more still underutilize it. Okay, why is this 
a bad way to, to do. What is the problem when we state our position clearly and with conviction? Do I see a hand going up there? It's one-sided. It's, it's one-sided and it's the wrong side, yes. This, this approach doesn't take into account either the pain or the need of the individual. Excellent. That you're working with. Excellent. <laughs> We're talking from where? Me, I, yeah, I want, I want. Okay, yeah, uh, it's, it's absolutely the wrong way to go because it turns people off when we talk about us. Let's face it, people don't care about us. They don't care about our products. They don't care about our services. They care about what? <laughs> Yeah, W-I-I-F-M, right? What's in it for me? They care about outcomes. They don't care about products. They don't care about services. They care about outcomes. And when we can put our frame of reference into those outcomes, then we got a, a better way to, to go about the persuasion process. Okay. Trying to persuade primarily with data, information, logic, reason, and statistics is, well, let's face it, it is an exercise in futility. And there are some reasons that we're going to share with you as to why this doesn't work. We've made it work, but it doesn't work very well. Even Harry Truman said, I sit here all day trying to persuade people that's all the powers of the president amount to. That's all I have. Look at today. What is Barack Obama trying to do? He's trying to persuade everybody and anybody. Okay? And he's doing a pretty good job of it in many cases. All right? So what are the building blocks of persuasion? Let's go back 2,500 years. And the building blocks of persuasion that were outlined by Aristotle primarily and by Plato when he worked with him are logos, pathos, and ethos. Okay? Logos is the logic, the logic of what it is that we're going to persuade. And there is a place for reason and logic in the persuasion process. There's a very important place for logic and reason. But it is not the place for making a decision. Anyone know what the, the place for logic and reason and rationality is? It's to back up the emotional decisions that we have made. We buy the car. And, and why do we buy the car generally? Because we love it. We love the color. We love the way it's going to look on our driveway. We like the way it feels, the way it drives, the fact that I'm driving a BMW or a Mercedes or a Lexus or whatever. And then we go in and we back it up with all the what? All the reasons, all the logic, good gas mileage, good uh, uh, reports from powers and, and all of that good stuff. Okay, pathos is the emotion part of our uh, decision-making process. And the ethos is our authority and our credibility. All of the triggers, the seven triggers that I have put into the book and that we have researched and determined are the, uh, there are literally an infinite number of triggers, but the ones that we have put into the book are all parts of logos, pathos, and ethos. It fits into all of those things. They had it pretty much right. The only thing that they had really wrong was the emphasis on the top and the bottom, uh, excuse me, the emphasis on the top one and the other two, and where they fit into the process. All right. Now, people respond to our requests, whether they are requests for decisions, requests for actions, uh, requests for, to do things or to give us something, whatever it is. They react in one of two ways. They will work thoughtfully or analytically using logic or mindlessly and emotionally using their own internal triggers. Now, who is likely to be a more thoughtful, analytical person when we are talking to them and we want to motivate them or uh, get them, persuade them to do something or to change a decision or action? Who would be in, in that analytical end? Anyone? Yeah, like could accountants? accountants certainly, scientists. scientists, doctors, lawyers, CPAs. Okay, all right. Uh, they might be a little more analytically minded. But here's the interesting part: the tougher things get with the process of thought and analytics, the more people rely on what their emotions. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, anyone remember the name of Carly Fiorini? 
president of uh, HP when they were doing the deal with Compaq. Remember that? The, it, it looked like uh, she took all of the votes, everybody took the votes, and it looks like the deal was not going to go through. She went and got on the radio and she used the, uh, one of the seven triggers that we have, uh, she used the, let's go back to that one. She used the uh, authority and the credibility trigger. That situation was so technically involved because there were a lot of um, uh, investment firms, there were a lot of employee uh, holdings and uh, a lot of big uh, firms that had billions of dollars in that. And she got on the phone and she said, if you cannot make this decision through the analytics, we recommend that you go with the decisions that have been suggested by the XYZ Corporation. This was a company that is set up to provide uh, information to large investors such as the state employee funds, teachers funds, uh, union funds, and all of that kind of stuff. And she, they, went to, they went to them and using the authority trigger, it went from about a 30% chance of success to about a 70% chance and the vote did go in HP's favor and they took over Compact. So even with the highly analytical people, the tougher things get, the more they rely on the triggers, the internal triggers that we have. Okay, so we said there are two response modes, uh, analytical, which is the logical, and automatic, which is the emotional. Now, the analytical thinker is thinking logically, systematically working through all of the issues, all of the concepts, and using analysis, judgment, and evaluation with a huge cognitive effort. The automatic thinker operates on gut feelings, basing the decisions on his or her automatic built-in psychological reactions. Those are the two ways that people make decisions. All right, now, here's the very interesting part. A strong body of research tells us that most of the people all of the time and all people most of the time are in the non-thinking analytic automatic, excuse me, the non-thinking automatic mode. Yet, most of our presentations, and trust me, I have been out literally with thousands of salespeople, and almost 100% of those presentations are made to uh, and geared to the heavy thinking analytical mode. Yes? Does a uh, logical thinking person, okay, need emotional, or does, does a logical thinking person need more data, more support, more information to feel comfortable about his emotional decision? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the critical part where I said that logic does play and reason and rationality and cognitive thought plays a very important role in persuasion. The decisions are almost invariably made on emotions, but the backup has to be even stronger for the analytical person. Good question, good question. And incidentally, uh, this is a very open forum, so any questions, comments, thoughts that you have, uh, please just let me know and I'll be glad to try to address them. Okay, uh, so most of our presentations are made in that way. To succeed, if you remember when we talked about the brain, we said one of the key elements that Dr. Restack put in his book, Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot, he said that we have to learn to work with the brain instead of against its natural tendencies. So to succeed, we've got to work with people and not against people. All right, now here's, here's, let's just close this one down for a minute. We have found that when we do a brain scan and actually measure the waves when people are working on a hard, difficult cognitive evaluation project, like a math uh, project, okay, we can measure certain brain waves, all right? Very easily done, very easily measured. What we have also found is that the same neurological scientists have discovered that we emit precisely the same brain waves when we were forced to plunge our hands into buckets of ice water. What does this tell us about heavy thinking? What, how does it make us feel? Stressful. Let's even take it a step further. How do we feel when we have to plunge our hands into ice water? It hurts. We're actually asking people to endure pain. 
when we present them with a rational, logic approach to doing something. Because they have to do what? They have to think about it. Okay? And we really don't like that. Here's another interesting evaluation. The same scientists have determined that we require 300% more calories for heavy thinking than for mental cruising. So what do we want to do? Do we want to make people endure pain? Or do we want to give them the easy way to make the right decision? Okay? When we make an appeal to logic, we are literally asking others to do the heavy lifting. Now this is where I said persuasion is not an event, it is a process. Guess what we have to do in order to be persuasive? We have to do the heavy thinking. So there's one of the keys to persuasion. When we do the heavy thinking, so that they don't have to, we endure the pain, okay, to do it all, so that we can present ourselves in a certain way, and we're going to get to that in the second trigger we're going to talk about. All right? It's as though we're asking people to jump into a bucket of ice water. Do we want to do that? Is that smart? I don't think so. I don't think so. The scientists have shown that it is actually painful. Why should we ask people to endure pain? Okay? We're asking them to invest 300% more energy into the process than they really have to do. All right? When we make an appeal to logic, we're asking them to do the heavy lifting. We've got to do it. It's as though we're asking them to jump into the ice water and we're asking them to do 300% more. We're making the process difficult when we want to make it easy. Skilled persuaders don't make it hard, they make it easy. Okay? Okay. The amygdala, which you see here, the amygdala is this very small almond-shaped part of the brain. I'd like everyone to say this, amygdala, amygdala, say it. Okay, because I want you to take this home with you. This is the most important part of the whole thing. To recognize that all sensory input we get, and I'm simplifying this because we don't want to be brain surgeons, but basically all sensory input goes to the amygdala. Does anyone know, anyone here involved in science or, or uh, otherwise, uh, understand what part of the brain the amygdala is? It is part of the limbic system, which is 100% emotion-based. The limbic system is our emotional system, and the amygdala is part of that system. So the amygdala actually acts like a switch. The amygdala has two options. When the sensory input, including our requests for action, our request for information, our request for closing a sale, our request for doing something, uh, happens, it has two, two elements. Number one, uh, it, it can make a decision, and we're going to get to that slide next, uh, or it can send the information to the prefrontal cortex where the actual cognitive thinking and the hard thoughts, the plunging the hands into the ice water and the 300% more energy takes place. Okay? So we have very good information here from Dr. Restack who says, unfortunately, the amygdala too often trumps the prefrontal cortex in almost all of us, and in almost all cases. So where do we want to focus the information that we present to people? Anyone? We have to focus it on the amygdala. And the amygdala is sensory based, it is emotionally based. The amygdala, when, when it receives a request for action, the amygdala goes back to the database that we started building when? At birth. We literally started that, and I'm going to share with that as we get to our first trigger, uh, how we started building this database that we have literally at birth. The amygdala goes back and it says, you know, did, did that ever happen before? How did I feel about that? Uh, what kind of reaction did I get? What was the sensory input that I got that I, that I did and so on? And it will then make a quick, easy decision. All right, the thinking brain evolved from the limbic brain. That we know, uh, the scientists have been able to prove that, and continues to take orders from it. 
The trigger point is the amygdala, a limbic brain structure that scans what's happening to us moment by moment. It commandeers other parts of the brain, including the rational centers of the cortex. So if we want to get people to do things, if we want to activate their internal guidance systems, we have to get to what? We have to get to the amygdala. All right, and that's from uh, Goyman and Boyatzis. And here's the, the really, really critical part, because for 2,500 years, we've been doing it backwards. We were taught that business culture places great value in an intellect devoid of emotion. Because we were told what? Emotions what? Get in the way, way of a good, rational business decision. We had it backwards. We literally had it wrong. And we could never know that until when? Till we could see what? The brain. Till we could see the brain, how it really works. Again, we don't want to make you neuroscientists, but it's critically important that you understand what happens uh, in our brain and how we go about getting that. Without emotions to guide us, we would be incapable of either decisions or plans. You just can't do it. We always react emotionally to even the most trivial of happenings. As things now stand, the amygdala has greater influence on the cortex Remember the cerebral cortex where the actual uh, cognitive evaluation takes place, then the cortex has on the amygdala, allowing emotional arousal to dominate and control our thinking. And yes, we have to back it up with the logic and reason and all of that, but the decisions are made on the emotional basis by the amygdala. OK, again, a reprise on that. Now, the platonic, platonic metaphor of the mind as a charioteer driving the twin horses of reason and emotion is on the right track, except that cognition is a smart pony. But emotion is a big elephant. And that's from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. OK, now here's the critical element. We can do one of two things. And maybe, maybe this, this uh, is a little bit uh, better picture even. We can provide a reason-based stimulus, OK? And as we said, the amygdala is a what? Acts like a switch. Good, OK? So we make a reason-based stimulus, and it goes up here to the amygdala. The amygdala, because it's a reason-based, not emotional-based, the, the, reason, the amygdala can't make that decision. So it sends the information where? To the prefrontal cortex for what? Rational cognitive evaluation, OK? Then the, we get either a delayed response, because the prefrontal cortex will send the information back to the amygdala, and we get a maybe a decision. If we get one at all, it is a delayed decision, OK? And we have forced people to act in ways that are unnatural and against the brain's actual processes. OK, those who learn to help people make quick, automatic, non-analytical decisions using their own inborn triggers will have incredible power over others. It's that simple. OK, good news from behavioral science. Persuasion works by appealing to deeply rooted human needs. We can learn to secure consensus, cut deals, and win concessions by artfully employing scientific principles of influenced people. Harvard Business Review. Isn't that what we want? Isn't this exactly what we want? To get consensus, to cut deals, to win concessions, to get people to agree to do what we want them to do? OK? That's what we're here for. That's what we want, want to learn. Triggers enable you to get automatic, non-thinking compliance from people. OK, we're going to talk about the triggers. And as I said, the name of my book is The Seven Triggers to Yes. And we have identified those internal triggers that form our internal uh, guidance system and the basics that we are uh, able to work with. All right, what are our goals tonight? Well, it's to understand the value and the impact of each trigger. It's to select, integrate, and organize specific triggers for each application that we have. And it's to consciously plan, structure, and deliver a powerful results. I'll use sales, but results producing situation uh, uh, for our presentation. Now, what is a trigger? 
What is a trigger? What is it that this amygdala, this little almond-shaped guy up in our brain, reacts to so well? All right? A trigger is simply a decision shortcut that your partner will use to make a decision and to avoid the pain of laborious logic, reason, and cognitive evaluation. The triggers are the things that we use to guide ourselves through every interaction with every individual and even with ourselves in every hour of every day. Triggers are part of the brain's internal navigation system and they allow us, allow our partner to quickly and automatically make the right decisions without the mental heavy lifting. Okay? When properly activated, triggers will create automatic compliance to a persuasion request. Put, put simply, a trigger is a decision shortcut. A trigger is a decision shortcut. What part of the brain controls our triggers? Say again. The amygdala. Yeah. The amygdala controls our internal triggers. And what we have to learn to do is to help people activate the right triggers based on their own gut feelings. Because that's really what we make the decisions on. There are gut feelings that are based on the databases that we have built up for our lifetime. And are we generally right when we go with our gut? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we generally are. What happens when we know we have a gut feeling we should do something and we do something differently? We're wrong. <laughs> we, usually, we usually wind up regretting it, don't we? And that is the amygdala at work. All right, now let's talk about the triggers themselves and see how these triggers would apply. Here's the one that really gets to the heart of things. The friendship trigger is one of the key triggers that we must use. The key to success, the key to everything we do, and the key to making any of the other seven triggers work well is based on the friendship trigger. It is absolutely critical that we employ that trigger uh, well and that we employ it correctly. Likeability, trust, similar interest, dependability, fairness, compatibility, similar dress, background similarity, cooperation, teamwork, collaboration, the list is endless. Now, if somebody doesn't like us, okay, I don't care whether they're an analytical or whether they are an automatic thinker, if they don't like you, you can give all the analytics in the world, and guess what? Say it. Not You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> Nowhere. Nowhere. Nada. Zero. Okay, <laughs> zip. <laughs> Whatever you want to use. You've got to establish the relationship with the friendship trigger. It is an absolute prerequisite to get any of the other triggers to work. How do we do that? Well, we have to bond with others by finding what? Common interest. Common interest. And if you leave with nothing else tonight except the awareness of the what word? The part of the brain? The amygdala. And one statement that I'm going to give you from the friendship trigger, I'll be happy because you will have learned a lot. Okay? Now, I'm going to share with you a personal story, one that, uh, that actually happened to me with a very analytical person. I needed an operation, okay? And I wanted the best doctor in the entire world to do it. And it was very hard to get to, it was very hard to get to see, and he was very, very careful about whom he operated on because he kept score. He was an absolute total analytic. His title was the chairman, in addition to being the chair of his department, he was the chairman of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Okay, you don't get any higher than that, right? All right? I was told when I went into his office for the first interview, and I actually use some persuasion skills to get that interview from his, uh, from his uh, person that, that made the appointment, his appointment secretary, of which there were many. And I was told by them, and I was told by people that were in his office and people who had recommended to meet him, they said, Russ, don't get into any small talk, don't get into any nonsense, go right to the point, this guy is an analytical, he just has very strict criteria, and I was not a good candidate for what he does. 
Okay, I was not a good candidate. So I got into his office, and I sat down across from the desk, and I violated every single rule that I was told. I said, Doc, what do you like to do when you're not working so hard? Well, you should have seen the look he gave me. <laughs> he looked at me as if I had horns. And he looked at me, for, he glared at me for a long minute. And he said, come here. And he walked me around to his desk, walked me around to the computer, put up his yacht club, the Westchester Yacht Club uh, website, where his 65-foot racing sailboat was listed and highlighted. And he said to me, he said, I love blue water racing. And I said, gee, that's great. I'm a boater. And I am. I've got seven boats. OK? I'm not a sailor. In fact, I hate sailboats because they get in my way of my powerboat. <laughs> and they think they own the road. But we got to talking about the wonderful elements of boating, the wonderful things that boating implies and does and all of that. And on every single meeting, the first thing that I said to Carl was, what's new for the morning glory, which was his 65-foot racing boat. And he would tell me, he would regale me with all of the GPS stuff that he's got and all of the new Kevlar sails. And he said, you got to watch those Kevlar sails because they cost over $100,000 each. And if somebody steps on it, it cracks and it's no good. I had this guy in the palm of my hand. <laughs> we were buddies. I also collect old antique magazines. And I found a bunch of yachting magazines from the turn of the century. And at the turn of the century, the boats were all what? Wood. Wood. And what? Sailboats. Yeah, because there were no power boats in those days until Oldie Evan Rood uh, invented one. OK? So I packaged them up. I used the reciprocity trigger. I packaged them up, put them in a nice box, got them to his secretary, uh, about a half dozen of these old guys. He flipped over this. That was absolutely great. Well, to make, a very long story, to make a very long story short, he did the operation, and I am alive today. <laughs> hey! <laughs> OK? The friendship trigger. This guy was an absolute analytic, but he, absolutely not. We, he, he manipulated me. He wanted to know more about my boats and what I did and so on. And I'll tell you a funny story about that. He, uh, I said, you know, uh, I, I'm so glad to find out that you love sailing, because my son-in-law just got a sailboat and I just got one. And he said, well, I never said that. He said, I hate sailing, but I love racing. <laughs> so we learned about each other, and we chatted about boating. And he performed that operation on me, even though I was a very poor candidate for his scorekeeping system. OK? We, had st we established a friendship trigger. So if you wonder about these friendship triggers, and, uh, or any of these triggers, and how they work, be absolutely certain that if you establish a friendly relationship with a very analytical person, you have a much better chance of getting your desires than if you really get them PO'd. Because uh, if they don't like you, you're, as this gentleman said, you're not going to get anywhere. And how do we get them to feel this bonding with us? How do we do that? Yes? But here's the thing. When you find interest of somebody else, first of all, the thing that I would like you to leave with tonight, if nothing else other than the amygdala and this, is that statement. What do you like to do when you're not working so hard? Please, please write it down, jot it down, remember, commit it to memory. It is one of the most important things that I can share with you. It is absolute magic. What do you like to do when you're not working so hard? I have asked that of people in emails, on the telephone, face-to-face, -face, letters, every way you can imagine. And guess what? How many people do you think turned me down or didn't answer it? Well, take it even further. None. None. I've got a 100% response. Why does that work so well? Themselves. People don't like to talk about themselves. They love to talk about themselves. 
Do you think that there's ever a problem drawing them out when you get them talking about the thing that they like most? Good God, that's the easy part. What's the hard part? Shutting them up. <laughs> okay? That's the key element to establishing the friendship trigger. So please remember that. It works in every situation. As I said, I use it on the phone, I use it on email, I use it face to face. It is incredible. It is a beautiful door opener. And to your comment about, yeah, we did find, now I was not a sailor, and he was a sailor. He didn't like power boats, and power boaters don't like, but we talked about boating rather than sailing or whatever. Now, somebody may come up with something that you don't know anything about, okay? What do you do then? Who said it? Yeah. Yeah, gee, that's really interesting. Why don't you, how do you do that? How do you get involved in that? How do you, how do you, yeah. And people will tell you. And guess what? The people that are designated as the best conversationalists in the world are the people that do what? Listen. listen. Ask questions and listen. Don't talk. Ask questions and listen. You'll be a great, great conversationalist, unquestionably, unquestionably. But this is an absolute critical element because when you bond with others, now why is bonding so important to the amygdala? Let's see if we can draw this out now. It's trust. It's trust. The amygdala is very risk sensitive. Jot that down in your memory. The amygdala is very highly risk sensitive. So it will react very favorably if it perceives that relationship and that trust. Because commonality, bonding of interest creates the feelings of trust. When did we start bonding with other people? At birth. Absolutely, the amygdala has been locking this stuff in since the moment of birth. So that when, and it builds trust, and trust alleviates the risk that is involved, and therefore, think about it. Who would you be more likely to do something with if somebody asked you to do something? Even if it's something you're not crazy about doing. A person who you consider a real good friend, or somebody who walks in the door and you don't even know? Pardon? A good, friend. a good friend. Yeah. Why? Because you trust that person. You have built the bond with that person. Just as we have built bonds with whomever takes care of us from the moment of birth. Whether it be a surrogate parent, whether it be an aunt, whether it be a, uh, an actual parent or whatever. We build that bond and the amygdala uh, trusts, uh, builds the trust from that situation. Okay. We talked about this, four out of five jury decisions are made before any evidence is presented, even though the judge gives the, the only information the judge, charge gives the judge or jury is to determine guilt or innocence in, <laughs> hello, evidence <laughs> based on the evidence, okay? The strongest element in the friendship equation is similarity and sameness. If we can show a person that we are interested in what they are interested in or interested in them, friends, you know, six degrees of separation. Friends of friends are what? Friends, friends. yeah. Turns out, uh, one, one of the first people that I met when we moved down to Maryland was a guy by the name of Nick Ray. Nick was my next door neighbor, uh, the former um, ambassador to Poland in the Clinton administration, and we started chatting, and I wanted to set a relationship, and I talked about the doctor who had worked on me uh, in, in that operation that I had to have, and he says, you've got to be kidding, Russ. He said, he was my next door neighbor up in Mamaroneck, New York, and he and Mary were our best friends. So we were friends, because friends of friends are friends. friends. Yeah. So we, we established a relationship right there. Okay? It, it's so easy to do, but it's so important to do because if you are creating trust with other people, there is a much better chance that their amygdala will react positively to your request for action and to your input. Okay, what are some of the things that we can talk about with other people? Leisure time. Anyone want to say what the question is? Come on, let's hear how good you remember it. Yes. Pardon? Do you play golf? Do you play golf? Yeah, that's, that's one thing. What do you do when you're not 
What do you do when you're not working so hard? Come on, guys, take it home. <laughs> Pardon? Do you go boating? <laughs> sure, sure. We can talk about boating, too. Okay, ask about their leisure time activities. Will they tell you about them? Good God. They won't stop. They won't stop. That's a, a very easy way. And what do you like to do when you're not working so hard? I can't drill that home uh, enough. That it's so critical to do. How about kids? Do people like to, if they've got kids, do they like to talk about them? <laughs> what happens if you get them going on their kids? Once again, <laughs> you can't stop them. If you have kids and they have kids and there's always something that their kids are doing, they say, oh my God, I can relate to that because mine did this or the neighbor's kids or Charlie's kids or somebody I know was involved in the same thing, went to the same schools, whatever. Excellent, excellent ways to get the amygdala on your side. All right, ask anything about the kids. And hey, the more specific your questions are, the better. And what we suggest you do, the whole application of the triggers is to use, and I'm going to give you a, 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 at least a temporary site if you want to jot it down. It's uh, seventtriggers.com, S-E-V-E-N triggers.com, spelled out seven. Uh, uh, that will not be our new site. It'll be the, uh, well, I'll give you that later. But the bottom line is there is on that, on that website a form that you can use and the form has all of the elements of each of the triggers. And what you want to do when you're making a presentation or you want to get somebody to do something or you're having a meeting with partic particular people and so on, you want to go through, and we said persuasion is not an event, it is a process. process. It is a process of you doing the hard work so that they don't have to. So you've got to prepare. You've got to prepare, and before every event, every situation where you want to persuade somebody, whether it be your CPO that you thought about earlier tonight or any other application, we want you to think about these and go through and see which of these triggers, yes, uh, Sam. But as you're preparing for this process, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, and we're going to share where that logic comes in. That's an excellent question. It is an application of your logic to make an emotional appeal. Excellent, excellent. We're never going to get rid of logic. We want to use it in several ways, but we want to use the logic, and we'll, we'll share a very interesting application of that when we get to the next trigger. But the thing is, what you want to do is go through, and that form is on there. It's a free form. You can use it. You can uh, download it. You cannot save it. Uh, you can fill it out, but you can't save it. If you want to have a form that's saved, uh, we have the training programs that will be available uh, on that site or on our next site uh, that will be savable, and you can have it. And uh, my son-in-law, who is vice pres uh, excuse me, president of Lucent Technology Wireless, he said, Russ, he said, You've got to make this a savable form because we are often talking to the same people a lot of times. When he goes to China, he's always talking to the same people. When he goes to India, he's always talking to the same people over there. So he said, I want a form where I can fill out their kids' names, their hobbies, the things that they do, so that when I go into that office, I've got it on my computer, I pop it up, the form is there. Uh, when I'm meeting with uh, Charlie Brown, I go to Charlie, and I got all the things that I can do to work with him on the friendship trigger or any of the other triggers. So that's the concept here is we're building a process to apply the triggers to the other person's amygdala, to their self-guidance system. All right, background. Where'd you come from? How did you do? It was the first question I asked Sam. Sam, where are you from? Talked about India. Uh, I said, well, I know people in Bangalore because they're doing our program. Well, Sam knows uh, Bangalore. In fact, he said, if I ever want to go to Bangalore, gave me his card and said, let me know, and I'll give you good restaurants and contacts and all of that good stuff. Okay? That's how it works. That's how it works. Find out where their background. Will people talk about their background? Most of them love to. Most of them love to. Okay? Where are you from originally? What brought you here? I asked Sam the same question. Why did you come here? What did you do before coming here? These are all elements of the friendship trigger. And what I do when I'm going to make a presentation or I'm going to meet with somebody or I'm going to do a, um, a sales call or whatever, 
I go through every one of these triggers and I laugh because it's so funny. I forgot that one. Oh, geez, this one will work. And it's just amazing. It is really magic how this stuff works. Uh, and I, I, you know, I wish we had more time because I could share so many personal stories of how these triggers work in the real world. This is not theory. It is not concept. This is application to real world. Okay, uh, so we'll talk about their business. Uh, how did you get started? Your education. We could go on uh, sports. People like, if, if they're males, if they play golf, uh, that's great. And we have friends, uh, male and female, who do it. These are the elements of the friendship trigger uh, and the things that we can talk about. Now, I want to just wrap up with, uh, with one other thing. Uh, and all of these are elements of just one trigger. So when you go online and you get the form, all of these elements are listed so that you can go through and say, gee, Charlie would be a good person to talk to about his kids, about he loves sports, uh, he doesn't like theater, and you can just check them off, put them on your list, and that way you can start getting your conversation and your presentation put together. Okay, uh, the last thing we're going to talk about there is avoid controversial issues. Okay, what do we not want to talk about? Politics. What else? Religion. What else? The Yankees. They won. <laughs> They're two and a half games up now, and I still know that from Maryland. How about that? Okay, mirroring is very important too. Be like that other person to the extent you can. And I'd love to share some wonderful stories about people who did not mirror other people and lost huge sales. All right. The last trigger that we're going to get to, and we've just got a few minutes to go, uh, is the authority trigger. This is absolutely critical. This is where your hard work and your knowledge and your uh, uh, ability to do the reason and the logic comes in. This is part of the hard work that you're going to do because, once again, persuasion is not an event. It is a process. And to the extent that you are considered an authority, okay, you will be perceived as being trustworthy. You will perceive, be perceived as knowledgeable. You will perceive to be all of the positive things. You will be perceived to have done the hard work so that he or she does not what? Have to do it. And that's the whole concept that we want to get here. All right? Aristotle put it very clearly. Character is almost, so to speak, that's pretty tough translation from the Greek that I did not do, uh, the controlling factor in persuasion. Aristotle had this one right on target, absolutely right on target. How did Augustus, Caesar Augustus, establish his authority before his legions to get people to follow him? He used just three words. Come on, guys. Three words that he began every speech with to establish his authority. Well, that's close. Vini, I can't say it again. I saw, I come. He began every speech with that after friends, Romans, and country. <laughs> okay, I came, I saw, I come. He established his credibility. When you establish your credibility, you have a much easier chance. I'm going to truncate this. When your physician gives you a prescription, do you go to the internet and to the database and to all of the filings for the uh, FDA and evaluate all of the chemical compounds and see what the interrelations between all these other things are? Or do you what? You go to the, prescri you go to the <laughs> prescription counter and you get it filled. Why? Why do you do that? Because you perceive the doctor is what? The authority. Okay? He has done the digging and the hard work so that what? You don't have to. Your, your partner doesn't have to. So we said it's a process and not an event. You've got to do the process of doing all of the hard work and being an authority. Now, if you are an authority, how can you show that? What ways can you share with that? I've got three cards in my pocket that have some pretty good authority triggers on them, okay? Office of Institutional Advancement, um, Sam, Dean, because uh, The first one is a very big one. Yes. <laughs> okay? 
If you have CPA, CPCU, uh, uh, any of the designations, where should you put those things? On your card, on your letterhead, on your website, every place you have. Let people know that whatever you are talking about, that you are what? An authority. authority. And the problem is, and uh, let's just get through these really quickly. Um, the problem is uh, that it, it fills our expertise for source credibility. And that is important to what part of our brain? Amygdala. The amygdala, because the amygdala is very what? Risk sensitive, okay? So when we, when we fill that need for source credibility, we are actually making the amygdala look upon us very positively. It's so powerful because we can make a quick, easy decision when we perceive someone else has done the pick and shovel work for us. Someone else has done the grunt work so that we don't have to. The amygdala is risk sensitive, the fight or flight syndrome recognizes here, and the decisions involve risk. Uh, what are the evidence of authority? Our experience, our training, our knowledge, our courses, degrees, our sincerity, our honesty, the articles we've written, the courses that we've taken. It is absolutely infinite the way that we can bring across. But let people know that you are an expert. But before you know that they're an expert, be an authority. Okay, do your homework, do your research, know your products, understand the business, know your company. Dress and bearing. I wish I had time to share some stories on that. It's very important. Your education, your degrees, your research, your experience, specialized knowledge and training, relationships with authority figures. If you don't know everything there is to know about that situation, bring someone else in. Do the research. Get on the web. It's easy to do today to become the authority. Your achievements, your promotions, your awards, your affiliations, endorsements. 65%, this, this is from surveys that have been run by Zig Ziglar's organization. Okay, everybody know probably who Zig Ziglar is. Uh, his book, Selling at the, uh, See You at the Top, has sold 1,500,000 copies. And here is a comment from one of his research uh, activities. 65% of persuasion attempts were headed in the right or wrong direction based solely on the perception that the other person had of the persuader. It gets right back to the jury situations that we talked about before. Okay. Where the key to real estate is location, location, location. The key to persuasion is credibility, credibility. And that's by, um, and this is Douglas Savini again. Uh, now here's from the Harvard Business Review. And take this to heart, please. We find that our research strongly suggests that most managers overestimate their credibility considerably. We tend to do that. We tend to do that. All right. Now, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, with, with one story. We started the first slide. Anybody remember who was on our first slide? Yeah. Jack Welsh. Okay. People say, well, Russ, do these you know, things really work? I mean, I'm a businessman. I own a business. Uh, you know, this is great in, in meeting with people and talking to people. I'm going to share a very simple story. Jack Welsh did, accomplished the most fascinating most incredible business turnaround in the history of American industry. He took a stodgy, old, going, nowhere company, General Electric, when he came in, and built it into the huge juggernaut, $144 billion in sales today. And he did that with one trigger and with one sentence. Jack Welch went to every GE office around the world all throughout the United States and all throughout the world. And he did not talk about any reason, logic, or cognitive thought issues. He did not mention the finances that were going to be involved. He didn't mention the partnerships between the companies. He didn't mention who was going to be hired and fired. He didn't do any of that, none of the details. He did it with one trigger, and it was the hope trigger, which is the last one in R7. And he did it this way. He said every, and he did this, this was his mantra. This was, was all he said in most of these meetings. He said every GE office that is not, or every GE business, excuse me, every GE business that is not number one or number two in its business will be either fixed, sold, or closed, period. He used the hope trigger. What did the people who heard Jack's mantra, his single sentence, hope for? Fixed. They hoped that they got it fixed, and, and then what? And kept their what? Jobs. Kept their jobs. That was the hope trigger. 
That was Jack Welch's mantra. That was the single phrase that he took around the world. He absolutely turned that company around, and that is the single sentence that he was given credit for. And that was the hope trigger, that people hoped to get the results he wanted so that they could keep their jobs. On that, I wish and hope for each of you to use the triggers, to understand what the amygdala and the limbic system is all about, and I hope that you have great success doing all of this. Thank you. You've been a great group. Really terrific. Thank you, Russ.